Well, welcome to Wash by the Word. Glad you're here. A couple of things going on. Um, as you know, we had the funeral today for a 16-year-old boy who uh, OD'd. And um, Gary and Alice's grandson, Roman and Phoebe's nephew. Well, uh, I just got off the phone with Phoebe now. And her brother is dying, it looks like, tonight. So she's out there. She and Roman are out there tonight now with him. So we want to just be praying for them as they go through that. And then I got a text message from Sid. And uh, Sid and Lois are on the other side of the mountain at their son and daughter's home, babysitting three little ones while mom and dad go to the hospital to give birth to a fourth little one. So... So we've got all kinds of things just going on all around there. It's just like all up in there messed up. So let's just pray. Let's just pray. God, we do want to just come to you right now. And Lord, we lift up all our brothers and sisters, different folks going through different things. <coughs> Lord, you tell us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials. And we read that and we think we have it until that trial hits us. And then it really changes becomes very real. And God, we're just asking now, Lord, that is Gary and Elsa and Michelle and the family just go through this grieving process. God, that you'd minister to their hearts. We pray for Roman and Phoebe now as they spend time just loving on, ministering to her brother and sister there. Lord, he knows you. He spent a lifetime serving you and loving you. Lord, we just pray for a smooth transition there into eternity for him. We rejoice with this birth of a, another new little one. Pray that everything goes well. Pray for a healthy baby, a safe delivery. We pray for the other pregnancies. We think of Amanda again here, Lord, and pray for James and Amanda and their, their little girl here, God. We pray that things would go extremely great. And the pregnancy would go full term and there'd be a healthy little baby, healthy little baby girl and a a safe delivery. Just lift them up before you. And Lord, many of us here just have little things, big things, minor things, humongous things that we're faced with right now. And Lord, we just lift up our heart's desire to you. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord. You tell us to thank you in all things, Lord. And you tell us to count it all joy when these trials do come. Lord, we saw and Second Corinthians, Lord, that you are the God of mercies and comfort. And you allow these trials, tribulations to come into our life, Lord, that we can grow and minister to others, Lord. It, it matures us and gives us the strength and the, the insight and the wisdom to help others, God. So, Lord, have your way. Have your way in our life, Lord. We just bow down before you. We trust you. We ask, God, that you show yourself strong. Now, Lord, as we get into your word, God, it's so fun to get in your word when the world's going crazy and we can just get into your word, God. We thank you for your word and the, the fact that you speak to us through it. God, help us to set aside all of the things of the day, the things of the week, and Lord, help us just to come into your presence in, through your word right now. Lord, we thank you for time of worship. And now, Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts as we just get to know a little bit more about you. And uh, God, speak to us, help us. Lord, we want to hear from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 7. <laughs> Revelation chapter 7. Last week, we did the first three verses of Revelation 7. We kicked it off looking at the last verse of chapter 6 of Revelation. And there it says, verse 17... That wasn't you, Shesley? Oh, you're digging in the first side. Oh, Shesley got busted. So we were finishing up in chapter 6. And as we looked at the first six seals being open, that sixth seal, remember, being the cosmic disturbances where the place goes completely whacked. And then it says in verse 16, remember, the people who are not following Jesus start to freak out and they ask for the mountains and the rocks 
as they're hiding in them, they say, fall on us and hide us. A worldwide prayer meeting, not crying out to God, but praying to Mother Earth, you know. And they said, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And that's where we kicked off. We, we talked about, okay, it's the day of God's wrath. Who's going to be able to stand in that? And that's what we saw in chapter 7. That question's answered. As we were looking at it, we said, oh, you remember in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2, Habakkuk cries out to God. He says, God, in your wrath, remember mercy. And we looked at examples of God showing mercy in the midst of his judgments. We looked at Noah and the flood, and he flooded the known world. He flooded all of it. He flooded the whole world. And he showed mercy to Noah and his family. We looked at Sodom, and he destroyed Sodom, but he showed mercy in the midst of his judgment and his wrath by removing Lot and his two daughters. We looked at Jericho. as Jericho was destroyed in the judgment of God, but yet we saw that Rahab and her household were shown mercy. We, we saw the children of Israel in Egypt for 400 years, and yet... We see God as he judged Egypt. He brought Israel out showing mercy. So we see that God showing mercy in the midst of his wrath is the way God is. That's what God does. God judges, but he shows mercy in the midst of the judgment. And in the book of Revelation, we see it's no different. We're going to see that God's wrath here now, the great day of his wrath has come. Who's able to stand? And we're going to see as we go through chapter 7, there are two groups that are listed here that stand, that are able to stand. We're going to see in the first eight verses, the the first group that stands is 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Tonight we're going to look at that number 144. We're going to see who are these 144 and who they're not. We're going to look just briefly, briefly at the history of the church to see some main players who had interesting positions on who the 144,000 are. Then we're also going to look at verses 5 through 8 at these tribes of the children of Israel that were sealed. The 144,000, 12 tribes of 12,000 each from each tribe. And we're going to see how they were sealed, protected, possessed. And we're going to look at the order in which they're listed and the significance of which ones are listed and which ones are not listed. And we're going to take a look at that and then we're going to sum up the whole thing about the 144,000 evangelists and the fruit of their ministry. We're going to actually see that the 144,000 are the first fruits of the nation of Israel coming to Christ. So it'll be an interesting study tonight. It's a fun study, 144,000. That's what we'll be looking at. We go into verse 1 here of chapter 7, after these things, the metatauta again. Guys, if we're in the Revelation study, those are the two Greek words you want to know. Metatauta, metatauta, metatauta. It shows up six times in the scriptures, six different places in the book of Revelation. And it always introduces a new vision. So now we're going to get a new vision. We've seen the six seals, metatauta, after these things. It introduces that new vision after the sixth seal has come to an end. And we're going to see, remember, that the shift, the scene shifts from judgment on the ungodly to protection for the godly, chapter 7. We saw, remember, the four angels, the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds. It says in verse 1, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. James, remember in his teaching on Sunday night, talked about the four corners of the earth and the northeastern wind coming from the corner and then being starting off, first off, was it an east wind or a south wind, a south wind blowing them up, and when it came from the right direction, remember, the straight on direction, that was a good thing, but he had that corner wind, that was a bad thing, and it says here, we see the four corners of the earth is holding back the northwest, the northeast, the southwest, the south, southeast winds, those were seen as winds of judgment. The number four in scripture, specifically in Revelation, speaks of the world. So now we have these, these winds coming from the four corners of the earth, and the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any, on any tree. So we saw that last week as we looked into the winds, and we, we did a lot of research on the winds in Scripture and how winds were used in Scripture to, to show God's judgment. We also saw that he often used angels to disperse his judgment. Then we saw in verse 2, then I saw another angel. Remember last week we saw it was the Greek word alus. meant another of the same kind. So another one of these angels. And we, we talked about these, this lower sphere of angels that the Jews looked at, these angels of service as the lowest realm, the lowest ranking of angels. And here we have these angels that work seven days a week. You ever see the wind blow on, on the Sabbath? Oh yeah. 
So these angels of service worked right on through the Sabbath, and because of that, the Jews labeled them as the lowest realm of the angel divisions. So we look at this and we see, I saw another angel of the same kind ascending from the east where the sun rises and now we have this, this ceiling of the living God coming from the east, the, the direction of the rising sun. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. We talked about the living God as composed of the pagans' dead gods and what it means to have a relationship with the living God and not a God that we create with our own hands but the living God who created us. So we, we looked at that and we, we saw, man, he's got the seal of the living God. We looked at a seal and what a, a seal meant. A seal, we talked about the seal and the, the leaders who have the different seals and all, but the main thing about a seal, remember, is that it, it stressed the possession, who you belong to, and also emphasized the protection that the sovereign would give to those under that seal. So we saw possession and protection, remember, last week. And then it says he cried out with a loud voice. In the Greek it was uh, uh, phone megale. Or sort of, you switch the words around so we get mega phone. It's basically phone mega. But he cried out with this loud voice. So you can almost picture it spiritually speaking like a big old spiritual megaphone. As this angel cried out to the angels on the four corners of the earth. We even talked about the four corners of the earth and the, the flat earth theory today that I tried not to laugh as I explained it. But it's very difficult not to laugh at that. <laughs> But as they, we did some scientific background studies, and in science they talked about, remember the elliptical shape of the earth and the equator being bulged, and in the, and in the equator bulging there's actually four little protrusions there that some scientists even actually refer to the four corners of the earth, interestingly enough. So science is finally now in the year 2018, we're, we're starting to get caught up a little bit with what God said thousands of years ago. So I know that like, you think we're all smart in that, but God's just smarter, guys. We've got to just Amen. live with that. Just settle down. Amen. God's smarter. Just deal with that. Amen. You want to get really messed up? Try this. God is smarter than me. Say that. Say that. Amen. God is smarter than me. Believe that. He really is. Because you know how we are. We think that sometimes he's so busy, we got a better idea, we can handle it. No. God's got it. He's smarter than us. He really is. Yes. By a lot. We are dumber than sticks. <laughs> compared to God. Don't ever forget that. You know, he's God. Come on, calm down. He's God. But this angel cries out with a loud voice to the four angels who was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we, the four angels plus this fifth angel from the east, have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And we stopped there last week. And as we stopped, remember, we went into the book of Ezekiel. And we saw that God was going to bring judgment on the city of Jerusalem, but he instructed to go through the city of Jerusalem and mark the inhabitants of Jerusalem, remember, with a mark on their forehead. We go, wow, check it out. Here it is again. We see the same thing. So we, we talked about those strings that tie from Revelation back into the Old Testament. There's a strong string from this being sealed on the forehead. And how interesting it is that these 144,000 are marked on their forehead for preservation. And later on, the Antichrist will mark on the forehead of his followers with the, the mark of man. So it's an interesting, interesting, interesting parallel here. He says, don't harm anything until we have sealed the servants of our God. So now we see that these servants of our God are true followers of the Lord. So these 144,000 seem to be people who have come to Jesus Christ for real after the rapture of the church, during the tribulation, and we're going to see tonight that they are of the nation of Israel. Hence, they are the first fruits of the entire nation of Israel who will come to Christ during this tribulation. And it's going to be the work of these 144,000 Jewish, we call them evangelists or missionaries, that the Spirit of God will work through removing the veils from the nation of Israel's eyes, and they will come to Christ. In Romans 11, verse 26, it says, all of Israel will be saved. And this appears to be the instruments that God will use to bring the gospel to the nation of Israel. So we have these 144,000. So now we get into our study. Oh, not, not yet. Yeah, we'll, we'll start our study right now. It's interesting as we look at these 144,000, these servants of God, that will be protected through the tribulation time, this time of judgment. 
it not only, this mark, this sealing, it not only is, seems to be invisible to man, but it's definitely visible, noticeable to the angels and to the demons that God uses to bring forth his judgment. And that's interesting as we look at the book of Revelation. Realize that the demonic presence in the tribulation is under the power of God and the hand of God. So we take a look at chapter 9. We'll see what we're saying here in chapter 9 of Revelation very quickly before we get into the study. Verse 4. Let's just go to verse 1. We'll, we'll get a heads up on it. The fifth trumpet. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as to scorpions, did the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree. So they were commanded not to harm, but only they could harm those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Can you imagine? But notice, they were given the authority to attack, but not to kill. That authority comes from God himself. So even the demons are under the omnipotent power and control of God during the tribulation period. So if you know Jesus tonight, you can calm yourself because you're not going to be here. Amen. If you don't know Jesus, you should know Jesus tonight. Amen. You should give your life to Christ for real. Stop playing the games and let's get real with Jesus. We can play games and say, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. But if we're living like the devil, we don't believe in Jesus. We're playing a game. Amen. But Lord, the Lord Jesus said, you know, come to me if you're heavy laden. And later on at the end of that verse, he says, I'll give rest to your souls. You can have confidence that you know Jesus. Monica, do you have confidence you know Jesus? You can say yes. <laughs> you do. <laughs> Monica, how long, have you known, how, how long have you known the Lord now for real? A week? Two weeks? A week tonight. One week. Welcome. After service last week, Monica, we were standing out in the floor, and all of a sudden Monica came walking up and says, Pastor, Reed has been talking to me about it. I went and saw it get baptized this last summer. I've been looking at it, and it's time. I want to give my life to Christ. I'm ready. Amen. So we grabbed a bunch of women, went in a room, and said, you pray. We're just going to join with you, girl. And it was sweet. And you've been in every service since. Girl, that's awesome, Monica. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. So here we are. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 were sealed. The first fruits of Israel. Now again, before we get into the text, we're doing this Old Testament background. We're covering just a few verses each night. Zechariah is towards the end of the Old Testament. So go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if we go to Matthew, then go to the book right before Matthew. And that will be Malachi. And then go to the book right before Malachi. And that's Zechariah. That's where we're going. Chapter 12, verse 10. Interesting, it says this in verse 10 of chapter 12 of Zechariah. God speaking through Zechariah, this young prophet. Remember, he's a young prophet, a visionary, always with all these visions. We studied Zechariah a couple, about six, seven months ago. He says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. So now they're going to be mourning, looking on the one whom they pierced. So we know this takes place after the crucifixion of Jesus. And we're going to see here, it's referring to this time of tribulation. Notice, yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn in that day. There will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. That's when Josiah was quickly killed, remember. And it goes through and lists the different levels of society, the kings and the prophets and the families, the priests and the individuals, and all, all grieving. And then in chapter 13, verse 1, again, in that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. 
Look at verse 8 of chapter 13. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third will be left in it. And I will bring one-third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name. And I will answer them and I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, this is my God. Zechariah looks to the, to the future and he says, there's coming a day when they're going to look at Jesus on the cross. And they're going to realize he's the Messiah. And they're going to come through this tribulation. A third of them will come through. And they will come to know Jesus as their Messiah. We saw in chapter 11 of Romans, verse 26, a number of times where there Paul says, all of Israel shall be saved. We've talked about Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 many times. How chapters 9, 10, and 11, chapter 9 talks about the past, Israel's past. Chapter 10 speaks of Romans' presence. And chapter 13, uh, chapter 11, girls, we're going to have you stay a little quiet, okay? We're glad you're here, but you've got to be a little quiet. Thank you. And in chapter 11, we're going to have um, God looking at Israel's future. So we've got their past, their present, and their future. And in their future, verse 26 of chapter 11, all of Israel will be saved. So as we look at that, and as we take a look now at this 144,000, we are going to see that these are the first fruits of all of surviving Israel through the tribulation getting saved. We're also going to see that those who were sealed, 144,000 of them, every one of them will make it through the tribulation to the end. In chapter 14 of Revelation, verse 1, it says this, then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as if it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women for they were virgins. They were the ones who followed the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men being the first fruits to God and to the lamb. In their mouth was found no deceit, and they are without fault before the throne of God. The 144,000, they are sealed, and they make it through the entire tribulation as they go out as missionaries out into a Christ and God-rejecting world with the gospel message. And we're going to see next week, not only does all of, nation, all of Israel come to Christ, but a great of all the nations come to Christ, the tribulation saints. The church is gone, but the tribulation saints rise up. Many of them are martyred, but it's these 144,000 Jewish missionaries that carry the gospel out into the world. It's kind of sweet. Now we get into verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. Those of you that are doing the Greek, it's a perfect passive participle. It gets you all excited, doesn't it? There it is. It just means it was done in the past and it was done to them. They were the receivers of the, of the action. So they were sealed sometime in the past. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. Those who became God's possession, period, and came under the protection of God, they were sealed. They were sealed in order to stand during this time of unparalleled persecution and tribulation, unparalleled judgment of God. They're sealed that they could make it through this time. To be sealed for this time, they were going to need an extra measure of spiritual covering, an extra measure of God's hand on them. They're going to be sealed in the midst of Antichrist, throwing out and spewing out <coughs> hatred, persecution under God's watchful eye. But he's, they're going to be targets. And God says, I am going to seal them. There's going to be an extraordinary impartation of the Holy Ghost on these 144,000 as God says, you're mine, you're safe, I've got you, go. If you want to see something very interesting, you remember last year we did a, as we were doing our minor prophet study, we studied the book of Joel. 
And there's a passage in Joel that's probably the most famous passage in all of Joel. Joel is the second of the minor prophets. If you go to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, then we get to the minor prophets. And that first minor prophet is Hosea. They're called, Monica, so you know, a major prophet and a minor prophet. That's just groupings of Old Testament prophets in the Old Testament. They're called major prophets, not because they're more important, they're just longer. So you look at that, you go, that's a major prophet, 66 chapters, that's major. Minor prophets are smaller, they're minor prophets, equally important, equally profitable for us. They're just smaller books. So the second minor prophet is Joel. And if we turn to Joel chapter 2, a passage of scripture that is used a lot if you've come from a charismatic background, you know Joel chapter 2 verse 28 because... That's one of the, the main texts. I was in a charismatic movement for a number of years, and this is one of our big ones right here. But in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, Joel, speaking of the future, he says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. And it was Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, remember, when the people thought at Pentecost, these guys are drunk. And Peter says, no, 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 it's nine in the morning. They're not drunk. This is just fulfilling what Joel had prophesied. He quotes 2, 28 and 29. But then as we go on into verse 30 as well, so it starts... This, this special giving of the Spirit of God to the church of Jesus Christ starts at Pentecost. But take a look here. In verse 30, we now all of a sudden see this major jump into the tribulation time. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Remember, we have studied all that already before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall, come, it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So we start to see this extra pouring out, if you will, of the Spirit of God on these 144,000. This extra protection, this sealing. We see in the book of Ephesians that when we come to Christ, we are sealed with the, the Holy Spirit. Well, these 144,000 are going to be sealed. And they're going to be guaranteed protection in the midst of the, the most horrific time in the history of the world. And God says, you're, you're going to make it through this. These 144,000. There are those who try to use the term 144,000 as a figurative term. And they say, well, you see, 144, if you take 12 times 12, that's 144. And if you divide 12 into 3 times 4, 3 is the divine number, 4 is the number of the earth. So by squaring 12, and that's 3 times 4, and squaring that is 144, 3 is the divine number, 4 is the number of the earth. So that's squared. It's actually saying, you understand, that the message is going out into all the earth. You take it times 1,000, that's 10 cubed. Three is a divine number. Ten is another, another number that's identified with the earth. So now for sure it's going all over the place. Well, yeah, that's all true. But we want to be careful about symbolizing and using figurative interpretations rather than simply believing what the Word of God says. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, you remember this. Elijah has been on the run after his victory at Mount Carmel over the prophets of Baal. And these prophets are killed down there at the Kishon River and all, and he, Jezebel hears about it, that her prophets have been killed by Elijah, and he, she says, may God do to, to me, and more so if you, Elijah, are not like one of my dead prophets tomorrow at this time. And here's Elijah who stood up to 400 prophets of Baal, stood up before all the nation of Israel and said, who are you gonna, whose side are you on? God's or Baal? Choose. He, was, he, he took a stand. And God delivered a tremendous victory there on Mount Carmel. And now he gets the threat of one woman. And Elijah freaks out, remember. He takes off running down to, to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, same place. And he ends up under that bush, remember. He says, just kill me, God. Just kill me. This is bad. Just kill me. The Lord comes and ministers to him through an angel, remember. And gives him some food, 
has them sleep. Gives them some food, has them sleep. Gives them some food, has them sleep. It's the biblical anecdote for depression. Talk about depression. He is suicidal. He's under a bush saying, I'm done, just kill me. And I've, I've read that passage so many times, I thought there's got to be some psych meds in here somewhere. <laughs> They're not there. They're not there. Which is amazing to me. You mean pharmacy is not the answer to depression? Really? But at any rate, you'd think it would be because, I mean, that's... At any rate. So what's God's remedy? Get some rest. Eat some good food. Get some rest. Eat some good food. Get some rest. Eat some good food. He's searching for God. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the wind. wasn't in the fire. He's in that still small voice. Don't allow the enemy to put it in our little pea brains. And I've got the, the smallest brain of the bunch. You know that. But we don't let the enemy put it into our mind that we need some drug because God can't take care of us. Amen. Amen. I don't care how many medical cards you have. Do you have your card stamped for heaven? Amen. And if you've got the heavenly card, you don't need no stinking medical card as an excuse to get high. Get high on Jesus. Knock it off. I just came from a 16-year-old overdose funeral. Last night I was at the funeral home most of the evening. The young people that came in, almost all of them were all high. You're coming to a funeral for a 16-year-old kid that OD'd, and you have the audacity to come do it high? At the funeral today, I'm watching the kids changing pills and taking their pills. During the, Are you serious? Come on, guys. Come on. Don't eat alcohol. Don't need drugs. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. And if you're, you're caught in it, then get into a program. We've got so many programs right now that we can get you in and help you. The MATS program will detox you. The SACS program will be really good. Steel Bridge is a great uh, ministry. We can get you in there. You get to expect a miracle. We've got all these ties to help you. Amen. Don't let the enemy rip you off, man. Amen. You have friends, you have family members that are caught in alcohol and drug abuse. Intervene and get them help. Amen. Get them help. They're Amen. caught. Amen. They're caught. Well, here we sit with... Elijah, waiting for, for God. He, good food, good rest, and quiet times with the Lord. Elijah, what are you doing down here? The Elijah complex is just me, God. I'm the only one of all your people that's faithful. Everyone else is out to lunch except me. Come on, be honest. You ever felt that way? Come on. Anybody have the Elijah complex besides me? Yeah. If you ever been in ministry, you got it, I guarantee you. And that's what he said. Remember God said, no, no, Elijah. I have 6,742. No, he said 7,000. I have 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Amen. You know why he said there were 7,000? Because there were 7,000. That's why. 7,000 means if you start counting, one, two, three, four, you'll get to 7,000. It wasn't some figurative number. God did it by 7,000. Well, seven's the number of completeness and perfectional no completeness, so he just means he's got to come. No. He said 7,000, there's 7,000. If God says it, that's what that means. Be careful with trying to read so much into it, trying to be so clever that we, we remove the meaning of Scripture. When the plain sense of Scripture is rejected, a foothold is provided for false teaching. And that false teaching usually develops itself into some type of cult-type teaching. Be careful of rejecting the plain sense of the Word of God. Be careful with that. When he says here there's 144,000 who were sealed, the reason he said 144,000 is because, you know how many he sealed? Ah, oh, you read it. That's right. 144,000. That's what that means. It means 144,000. And it says, right here it says, uh, there were 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. When he says all the tribes of the children of Israel, do you know what that really means? 
Exactly. Don't make it hard. It's what it is. All the tribes of the children of Israel. That's what it means. That's what it means. We said when you start to go a little bit crazy on that kind of stuff, you get some cultic teachings. Well, there are many of what are considered cults today, and the reason they're considered cults is because they are cults. A cult is someone, some group of people, that has the wrong description, relationship, understanding, presentation of who Jesus Christ is. That's a cult. There are people that we might disagree with theologically within the body of Christ. Those are called brothers and sisters. <laughs> and who's going to love them? And you want to get really messed up sometimes in some of the th theological positions we take? We might be a little bit askew. We might even be wrong sometimes. But there, it's not salvation issues, and it's definitely not break fellowship issues. <laughs> But when it comes to Jesus, if you're going to sit here and say, well, Jesus isn't really God, that breaks fellowship. Well, you understand there was a time when Jesus wasn't a real being, and they go into the Arian heresy that was d d first decided to be a heretical position in 325 at the Council of Nicaea, and then at Chalcedon said, no, it is wrong. Well, then that's wrong. And you can change the name from Arian heresy to the witness for Jehovah, I take offense to that. I'm a Jehovah's Witness because I witness for Jehovah. How dare you take the name of God and say you're a witness of him and teach false doctrine. Wow. That's just wrong. That's just wrong. It's a cult. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses take the number 144,000. They've done some interesting things with it. And I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of it. I'm going to stand off to the side because I don't want to be behind the pulpit when I spew this garbage out. So I'm over here. But the Jehovah Witness says this, that 144,000, I don't have this memorized and I'm not going to memorize it, but 144,000 are the number of spirit begotten believers who have a heavenly hope. All other believers can only have an earthly hope. So the 144,000 go to heaven as long as you're part of the 144,000 and you were born before 1935. After 1935, you are no longer part of the spirit-begotten believers with a heavenly hope. You are part of a group of believers that have only an earthly hope. So if you were born after 1935 into the Jehovah Witness religion, you come into the Jehovah Witness religion, you will not go to heaven. But you will spend eternity on earth. Your earthly hope. That's just what it is. That's what it is. Well, that worked pretty good as far as the 144,000 obviously until their membership went over 144,000. <laughs> so now they've changed that and they've said that you know it's part of the great multitude at the end of chapter 7 we'll look at next week. But what's so sad is is people really get into this and when we get in a cult, one of the things that happens is, is we start to look at ourselves as very exclusive. We're the only ones with the answer. The Jehovah Witness, unfortunately, removes people from their family. We have a foster daughter, I believe, that's involved in that now. And we've lost her the last couple of years. And um, she was part of your family for 30 years. Connie was a foster mom for her. And uh, after we got married and her dad died, she said, can I call you dad? I said, of course, you can call me dad. And all of a sudden she disappeared. She and her husband, her mother-in-law was a Jehovah Witness and she disappeared. And that's the danger of it. And we can say, well, that's just crazy, but it's not crazy, it's very real. And the enemy uses this type of stuff to pull people away from the true message of the gospel. And it's something we want to be really careful of, but you will run into this 144,000 that it, it is something to do only with Jehovah Witnesses. I'm not going to start doing a, some kind of apologetics course on Jehovah Witnesses. No, no, I, I don't want to know about Jehovah Witness. You've heard it said many times when they're, the Treasury Department, their agents are looking for counterfeit dollars and counterfeit bills. They don't study all the counterfeit bills. They just study the real deal. And when they get to know the real deal so well, they can spot any counterfeit because they say, that's not the real deal. They don't have to know why. They just know it's not what it's supposed to be. That's what I want to encourage you to do. Don't get all caught up in all the ins and outs of the different cults and all the different things. 
get all caught up in Jesus and get to know him so well. When you run into these cultists out and around, don't reject them, love them, but let them know the truth. Just let them know the truth. Don't invite them into your home and study with them. Don't do that. Don't do that. But invite them to church. We'd love to have Jehovah Witnesses here. That'd be great. If you want to get rid of them, just invite them to your birthday party. So here it goes. That was a joke. Sorry. Bad joke. Bad joke. Bad joke. Sorry. Sorry. Bad joke. But the 144,000 is the number of the Jehovah Witness. Historical Mormonism also claimed to be members of the 144,000. Those are the two cults. Um, there's a sect today known as Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, they're brothers and sisters. They're a sect, not a cult. They have the exact right concept of Jesus Christ. But they also adhere, obviously, to keeping the Old Testament law. The Jehovah Witnesses, by definition, are a sect. Are the Jehovah Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, are a sect. And I do believe with everything in me that there will be many Seventh-day Adventists who will go into glory and spend eternity with Jesus. I believe there will be some Roman Catholics that will go to heaven. I believe there will be some Protestants that go to heaven. I believe there might even be a handful from washed by the word that will make it into heaven. There might be. There might be. But it's all going to depend on our walk with Jesus and our faith with Jesus Christ. The Seventh-day Adventists... They believe you need to be born again. But they also believe that the 144,000 refers to them. The Worldwide Church of God, I haven't heard about that or looked at that for so many years. So I went online this past week just to look a little bit at Garner Ted Armstrong again. And don't, don't do it. Don't do it. He's out of Texas. and It's just weird. But he's one of the 144 as well. So he believes that they're the 144,000. The question is, why do that? Why do that when it says, I heard the number were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of children of Israel were sealed. Why stand up and say, no, that wasn't the children of Israel, that was us? Why do that? One of the best things I've seen, and I've seen it over and over and over, I've heard it over and over and over, and I'm going to just give it to you. It's not me, I'm just regurgitating what I've been taught, what I've read, and what I've seen. Why do that? Because by doing that, you conveniently write out Israel from prophecy. You basically say that Israel is done. It's the seedbed of anti-Semitism. It started all the way back in the days of origin. We mentioned last week at the end of the study, Augustine. I look at James whenever I say Augustine now because he's my new Augustine guy. Luther, everyone knows that's Pastor Anthony now, he's doing Luther. So, Origen, Augustine, Luther, all took the position that this does not refer to Israel, the nation of Israel, but that it refers to the church. That Israel means Israel in Genesis, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, in the book of Joshua, Israel means Israel. When you get into Judges, Israel still means Israel. Ruth, Israel means Israel. First, second Samuel, first, second Kings, first, second, Israel means Israel. You can go through the entire Old Testament. Israel means Israel. You can get to the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Israel means Israel. You can go to all Pauline letters, the book of Hebrews, if it's Pauline or not, and all the general epistles from James to Jude. Israel means Israel. So for the first 65 books of the Bible, if you see Israel, it means Israel. However, when you get to the book of Revelation, you see Israel here, it doesn't mean Israel. It means the church. Hermeneutical, hermeneutic interpretation says there's got to be, it's the law of consistency. If it means it here, it means it here. That's what it means. If it says Israel, it means Israel. If it says 144,000, it means 144,000. The doctrine that says Israel in the book of Revelation refers to the church is known as replacement theology. It's a non-biblical position. It's saying God is through with Israel, even though the book of Romans says it's, he's not through with Israel. And it's wrong. It's just wrong. I'm not going to get into it much more than that, then it's wrong. 
It's also called Reconstructionism. It's called Kingdom Now Theology. It's been around for years. It's not something new. It's been around since origin's time. Martin Luther, uh, I was brought up Lutheran. Hello, I studied Luther. I love Luther. He's, he's, I love him. So I got Pastor Anthony all over Luther right now. I'm learning all kinds of stuff about Luther. He's studying Luther. Tell me more. Tell us it's great. Today, real quick, tell us, this is cool. Tell us about the bald head. <laughs> this is good because Pastor Anthony's got a bald head and so do I. <laughs> so I heard that, uh, or I read that <laughs> the monks started shaving their heads on the top because the first century Christians they would shave their heads purposely to humili uh, humiliate them. So the monks would do it so that way they could kind of just uh, join in in what, what the early Christians had to go through. So that was why they shaved just the tops of their heads. I got that all twisted. I was always told that God made a few good heads. <laughs> and the rest he covered up with hair. But what do I know? I don't <laughs> But... I, I find that so interesting. I find that so interesting that with Luther, there's... I love this guy. But he took replacement theology. Back in the 16th century in Germany. And it pervaded into the churches of Germany that the Jews rejected Jesus Therefore, God rejected the Jews. And it just formed a, a soft, quiet seedbed for 400 years. 300 years. 70, 80, 90, 300 years. This anti-Semitism that was then just lit on fire. It's a very dangerous, dangerous, dangerous theology. And it starts as simple as saying, well, that's not really Israel. You can't really believe it's Israel because God's done with Israel. He's not done with Israel. This is chosen people for a purpose. And he's not anywhere near done with them. The Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 says, I'm going to bless those who bless you. And I'm going to curse those who curse you. You're not done with Israel. You're not done with Israel. He says he's going to have a new covenant where he's going to forgive and forget their sins. He's not done with Israel. No way. No way. Well, we take a look at this, and as we look at this replacement theology, guys, and it's important that you really understand this. I don't really care if you understand Jehovah's Witness or not. Just know they're whacked. You don't have to know all the ins and outs about them. Replacement theology is so insidious. It's so easy to, to, to bounce into. So really have a heads up on that. But realize that there is no biblical scripture to base it on. Nothing. Nowhere is the church referred to as Israel. Nowhere. Nowhere. We are said that we are the spiritual seed of Abraham. Yes. But never are we said we're the physical seed of Israel. Never. Never. It's not scriptural. British imperialism, another group that takes that same position. There's so many of them. But just be aware of replacement theology. If you hear replacement theology, replacing Israel with the church, nay, nay. Israel is Israel all the time. Bulgarian, sorry. So verse 5 to 8. I saw the smile. So, and I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And now verses 5 to 8, we get something very interesting here. We have a listing of the tribes. In all of Scripture, there are 19 different listings of the tribes of Israel. 19 different ways the tribes are listed in Scripture. This is the 19th. This is the 19th one right here. Notice as we look at this a couple of things. First off, we're going to notice that the first tribe that's mentioned is Judah. As we get ready to look at this list, there's a couple things we do want to look at, and that is throughout the listings of all of Israel over and over and over again, 
Well, notice there are 14 different tribes of Israel. 14. But only 12 are listed at a time. When we get into the book of Genesis, we, we look and we look at the children of Leah and Zilpah and Bilhah and Rachel. We go, oh, there's 12 right there. There's the 12. What do you mean 14? Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. We go and we look at Joseph, remember. He was the, the 11th of the kids. Joseph. But remember, he's in Egypt. His dad comes up and says, bring your two older boys here. Remember that crossing of the hands with Manasseh and Ephraim and all? Well, those two plus 12 make 14. But whenever we see the listings of the tribes, they only list 12. But they're different orders and different names. Levi is very, uh, oftentimes is eliminated, oftentimes. Because remember, the Levi tribe was not to inherit land. So any listings of the tribes when it comes to land allotment, Levi won't be in there. They were also not to go out to battle. So you'll notice oftentimes Levi isn't mentioned in their battle array or something like that. So Levi, oftentimes not mentioned. Usually, if Levi is mentioned, they won't mention Ephraim and Manasseh. They'll just say Joseph. And Joseph stands for Ephraim and Manasseh. So sometimes if you see Joseph, look, you'll see Levi in there with them. So you know, they just use him differently. All the time using him differently. This is a real interesting one here. Because here in this list, we see six pairs and the pairs tend to go together. We'll do them very quickly. It's, it's just something I just want to mention as we go through. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. The fourth and the first born of Leah. Judah, the royal tribe, the messianic tribe. Reuben, according to Genesis chapter 49, verse 3, the tribe that represents the nation of Israel. So we have the royal tribe and the tribe that represents the nation. Then the next two. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Gad and Asher, the two sons of Zilpah. So they go together. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. In Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 4, in the land allotments, these two are put together. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Ah, these are the two brothers, remember, who were the brothers of violence, of anger, and of wrath, remember, and these are the two brothers that went into Shechem and killed the Shechemites and that whole Dinah issue and everything. These are the second and third of Leah's boys. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. The fifth and sixth of Leah's kids. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. The tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Rachel's two children. So we see how they're paired up. 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 It's interesting, but as we look at this, what we want to grab is first, notice Judah is first. The Messianic tribe is first. The other thing that's interesting is notice Joseph is there, and so is Manasseh. That's very rare. Usually if Joseph is there, his two sons are not there. Ephraim and Manasseh are not there, but Manasseh is there and Joseph is there. So we look and we see Ephraim's not there. And the other tribe that is very obviously missing is the tribe of Dan. And this becomes very important in the book of Revelation. Dan and Ephraim are omitted. Dan often connected with idolatry. In the book of Judges, remember, when the Danites move from the coastline with the Philistines, they go all the way up to Laish and they take over Laish and they're up in there and then in the book of Judges we see this false religion taking place with the Danites. What's also interesting is remember when Jeroboam places the two calves after the civil war in Israel and Israel and Judah split into two nations. And remember, Jeroboam says, I'm going to put these two calves and you don't have to go to Jerusalem and worship down there anymore. You can worship up here. And he puts one up in Dan and one in Bethel, which is in Ephraim. So these two nations, are these two tribes that are not mentioned here are the two tribes that had this false worship come into the northern ten tribes of Israel, interestingly enough. Dan and Ephraim, often in the Old Testament, associated, affiliated with idolatry. Why is that interesting? 
Let's turn our Bibles to the fifth book of the Bible. And we're going to be done in about six minutes, guys, so hang on. Deuteronomy chapter 29. You know the blessings and cursings chapters. Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 29. Remember the blessings of God, you can't run away from them. No matter where you go, he's going to just hunt you down and bless you. You're stuck. Just try and run away from the blessings of God. It's not going to happen. But then he goes on and he says, but if you disobey me, you're going to have curses and you can't run away from them. Just try it. You go in the city, you go in the country, I'm going to hunt you down and the curses are going to follow you. Can't run away from the consequences of sin. We can't <laughs> run away from the blessings of obedience. We're stuck with them both ways. It's just what it is. But in chapter 29, verse 18 of Deuteronomy, it says this, So that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. There may not be among you a root of, of bearing bitterness or wormwood, and so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself and starts saying, I'll have peace, even though I'll follow the dictates of my heart. And though the drunkard could be included with the sober, the Lord would not spare him, for then the anger of the Lord is jealousy would burn against that man, and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him, and the Lord would blot out his name from under the heaven. And the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of this law. There it is. He says, if you get involved in idolatry, God will separate you from the tribes of Israel. And the two tribes in the Old Testament that identify most with idolatry, Ephraim and Dan, are not in this list right here, interestingly enough. And because of that, specifically Dan, an interesting thing has happened in the early, early Christian writings. When it looks at this list, be it Polycarp, be it Arrhenius, Arrhenius, the disciple of Polycarp, Hippolytus, the disciple of Arrhenius. Hippolytus. He wrote in the year 202. 202. He wrote this. Speaking of Dan. He says, As the Christ was born from the tribe of Judah, so will the Antichrist be born from the tribe of Dan. Now that's an early Christian writing. But you will hear sometimes talking of Antichrist talking. I don't like to talk too much about the Antichrist. I want to talk about Jesus Christ. But when you hear about Antichrist, you will hear different things. He's from the Syrian background. He's from the, the, the revived Roman Empire. He's, but he's Jewish. All these things, this whole Jewishness comes from this Dan, the apostate tribe of Dan. That's where this comes from. And they fall back to Jeremiah. And we will turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 8. We'll see it there. In Jeremiah chapter 8, something very interesting here in verse 15. It says this, We looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and there was trouble. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones. For they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. Now, obviously, this is referring specifically to the Babylonians coming on in, as Jeremiah is writing. But remember, we talk about the two mountaintops of prophecy. There are those who go to that last mountaintop at the end times and say, could this be a reference to the Antichrist? Notice in verse 17. For behold, I will send serpents among you, vipers which cannot be charmed, and they will bite you, says the Lord. And they say, could that be a veiled reference to the Antichrist? Well, that's up to you in further study. But I want you to know where that whole understanding of could the Antichrist be coming from Dan, could the Antichrist have Jewish roots? Is that why Dan is not mentioned in the book of Revelation here in this listing of the tribes? I don't know. <coughs> I'm just saying that is out there. If you're interested in that, check it out. What is interesting is in Ezekiel chapter 48 in the millennial reign, it lists the 12 tribes of the millennium. Dan is not in the tribulation listing. But in the millennial, the thousand year reign, the very first tribe, we've got to see it to believe it because it's pretty cool. Ezekiel chapter 48, it's right after Jeremiah and Lamentations, there's Ezekiel. The last chapter, I believe, is chapter 48 in Ezekiel. 
We take a look. Yep, there it is. This is Ezekiel 48. Look at the first verse of Ezekiel 48. Now, these are the names of the tribes, talking about the division of the land. From the northern border along the road to Hethlon at the entrance of Hamath to Hazan Enon and the border of Damascus northward in the direction of Hamath, there shall be one section for who? Dan. Dan is in the millennial reign. We see in the middle of God's wrath mercy. There it is. Millennial reign, Dan is there, the mercy of God. I love that verse. Dan is out in the listings during the tribulation. But in the millennial reign, there he sits. Who's the first one mentioned? Dan. Dan. I love it. At this time here in Revelation chapter 7, these evangelists are going to go out. Israel is given a chance. We remember that the nation of Israel's main mission was to be a light to the Gentiles. They were given a message, and they were to take that message to the Gentiles. But in the history of the Judaism, what they did instead is they said, look at God has blessed us, isn't it good? And it became a bless me club. You ever been in a church like that? I hope this church isn't like that. Where this is a great place to be because we just come in here and we just love Jesus. No, we're to be a light into the world. We come and get fed, equipped, and we go out there and we tell people about Jesus. That's what we do. We tell them about Jesus. We live a life that people look and say, I want what you have. You've got something. I want that. And then you don't say, well, come to church and get saved. You say, let's just, let's just lead you to Christ right now. That's okay. Now, if you're not comfortable, bring them to church and they'll come up to you after service and say, I want to get saved. And they'll put them in a room and the ladies will pray with them and they'll get saved. But, you know, <laughs> but you can lead them to Christ. You can just say, let's just pray. Just come to Jesus. It's good. It's good. This is an equipping station. We're to be lights. Well, the nation of Israel is to be a light. But instead, they, they covered their light. But God is the God of the second chance, we always say. And here in the book of Revelation, we see that God gives them a second chance. There will be a light to the world. These 144,000 Jewish evangelists go out, and this time the nation of Israel hits a home run. God flows through them, he's protecting them, and they go out, and they tell the world about Jesus. And we're going to see next week, oh man, from all the nations, a great multitude of people come to Christ, knowing they come to Christ, they'll probably die. but they're willing to die for Jesus. Today we're not called to die for Jesus. We're, we're called to live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. If you ever put in a position where we need to die for Jesus, God will give us the grace at that time. We just keep our eyes on Jesus. Don't sit and think about that. Just think about Jesus and tell people him, be a light shining for Christ. But Israel now is going to get a second chance and they're going to do it. And it's going to be awesome. So who's 144,000? They're Jewish evangelists. How many of them are there? 144,000. How do you know that? Because it says there's 144,000. They're Jewish evangelists. They're not the Jehovah Witness. They're not the Mormons. They're not the Seventh-day Adventists. They're not the Worldwide Church of God. They're not the Church of Jesus Christ. They are the nation of Israel. 12,000 from each of those 12 tribes right there that God is going to put a seal on is a mark of his possession and his protection. They're going to go out into the world during the tribulation telling people of Jesus and people are going to come to Christ. God is going to remove the veils from the nation of Israel's eyes and they're going to come to Christ and there's going to be Gentiles all over the world we're going to see next week to come to Christ during this time. It's going to cost them their life. They're going to do it. The Antichrist in chapter 12 we're going to see is going to go after the nation of Israel at this point. They're going to run somewhere into the desert somewhere, and they're going to hide out. God's going to protect them. I don't know where it's going to be, but I've got a real strong opinion of that. And in three months and two weeks, a number of us are going to be in Petra. And we're going to do a Petra study before we go that night. We're doing our Israel tour again this June. Right now we're up to 36 or 37. 37, I think. 36, 37. It's growing. And it's still not too late. You too can come to Israel with us. Come on. We'd love to have you. It's not too late. But we're going to go to Petra, the very place where many people believe this is where God is going to take the nation of Israel and place him in Petra and be able to protect the entire nation of Israel there from the Antichrist coming in on, on them. When we walk through the Seek, this mile-long, narrow canyon road, we're not going to walk, we're going to ride through it this time on these little horse-drawn buggy things, but we're going to hustle on in there. And we're going to go back into all that area of Petra. We're going to see, oh my goodness, 
And as we look around, we might see some tracks. Usually it's in Hebrew, so we're not going to be able to understand them. But there'll be tracks in Hebrew. Because many people believe it's going to be here where many of the nation of Israel is going to come to Christ. So Christians have put a bunch of tracks, hit them all throughout Petra in Hebrew. So they come there. If you're here, Jesus loves you, man. Here's the gospel. It's going to be cool. Who knows? We might find some. Don't take them home for a souvenir. Leave them there. <laughs> leave them there. Come on now. Don't be dumb. Just leave them there. But you might see them take a photo of it. Look at this track right there. It's probably a bubblegum wrapper or something. We don't speak Hebrew. You know, who knows? But, but there are tracks in there. There are tracks in there. So it's, it's an exciting time, guys. Petra is like amazing. So we'll be looking at that going forward. We'll be looking at that going forward. But the nation of Israel is going to come to Christ. It's a tremendous, beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. There's no place in the body of Christ for anti-Semitism, to be against the nation of Israel. That comes out of flat-out ignorance. Read the word of God and love the nation of Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Stand with Israel no matter what. Stand with Israel. May God bless you guys this week. Next week we look at all these tribulation saints. They come to Christ, become these tribulation saints. Many of them become martyrs. We're looking at that next week as we finish up chapter 7. We've been in the book of Revelation now, I think, six months. And we've covered six chapters. <sighs> we'll pick it up a little bit, but that's what we got. God bless you guys. Come on up, Randy Lynn. Please send us on out of here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a night of just walking through your word. God, we thank you so much for the truths of your word. God, anything I've said that's distracted from you, God, to help me and everyone else just to forget that. God, help us just to look at your word, to take what it says literally every chance possible. God, we're not here to make fun of the cults. God, our heart breaks for them. We pray. I, I pray for our daughter, Christy, Lord. And we have two Christies. I, I pray for this Christy that's here in Albuquerque, Lord, that's been deceived into this. And God, we can't even reach out to her anymore, it seems. And God, I just pray that she would come back to you. Many of us have friends that are in the Mormon churches, and the Jehovah Witness churches, or whatever they are. And different groups that, Lord, they're, they're being deceived. God, we just pray you open with our eyes and just draw them back to you. It doesn't have to be to this church, Lord, just a church where they can come to know you afresh. Be fed your word, be loved. God, we pray for, again, for the family of uh, Ezekiel tonight. God, we pray you minister to their hearts. And God, we pray for the salvation of so many folks right now in that family who don't know you. God, we pray that they would come to know you, for real. They'd be set free from the power of drugs and alcohol. Lord, that they would be able just to walk with you. In Jesus' name.